Okay, there we go. So welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today for a very important conversation. Uh, I'm Heather McGrail, the Greater Manchester Chamber Membership and Community Partnerships Director. And I'm very pleased to be hosting a program about the Recovery Friendly Workplace Initiative. Uh, our chamber recently became designated as recovery friendly, um, uh, as a recovery friendly workplace. Uh, and we have had such a wonderful, um, eye-opening, impactful experience uh, that we really wanted to bring this to the business community as much as we can and really help to um, enlighten everyone about what it really is about. So we have the perfect person to, to lead that charge today with Karen Morton-Clark, um, who is a, I'll try to get all these acronyms right, is a CRSW, which is a Certified Recovery Support Worker, and a RFA, Recovery um, Friendly Advisor, um, with the New Hampshire Recovery Friendly Workplace Initiative. So uh, Karen is going to share a ton of information with you. Um, let me just admit a few more. I can never do two things at once. Uh, and I'm going to just kick it over to her, but a few kind of just uh, PSAs first. We want to put your um, any questions into the chat, please, um, because it's a very packed presentation with a lot of um, different speakers to uh, share with you guys, and we want to make sure um, to get to it all. So if you have questions, I'll be monitoring the chat throughout, um, and we will linger after the event um, for some open question and answer time uh, that you certainly can uh, feel free to stay on for. And I think that's all the announcements I have, so I'm going to kick it right over to you, Karen. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much, Heather. I'm gonna go right ahead and share my screen. And so just bear with me for one second while I do that. There we go. So um, I am just so thrilled to see so many businesses here today for this presentation. It's really good to see some new and very uh, diverse businesses, diverse sectors represented in this group um, and who are interested in learning more about the Recovery Friendly Workplace Initiative. And I also just want to mention that I'm also very um, happy to see some of our Recovery Friendly Workplace champions. Uh, Jimmy, uh, I'm happy to see you here. You've been a longtime supporter of the Recovery Friendly Workplace and others that you'll hear from who will share the benefits and impact of all things recovery within their individual workplaces. I'd like to uh, thank Heather and the Greater Manchester Chamber once again for this opportunity to present uh, to you today on the Recovery Friendly Workplace. And my hope is that at the end of this presentation, we'll all agree that this initiative is good for employees and also good for your business. So with that, I'm gonna roll right into it. So I'd like to start out with um, the, the American Society of Addiction Medicine definition of substance use disorder. And this is uh, something, substance use disorder is something you'll hear me and others reference quite a bit in this presentation. So I just like to frame it with the definition that the American Society of Addiction Medicine adopted in 2019, which is to say that addiction is a treatable chronic medical disease. People with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. And they also note, and I think this is really important, that prevention efforts and treatment approaches for addiction are generally as successful as those for other chronic diseases. So with that, and especially for the benefit of some of the uh, businesses who are new to the Recovery Friendly Workplace movement, um, I just wanted to share that the initiative was launched in March of 2018 by Governor Sununu, and everything that we've done since then and, and currently do is intended to promote health, safety, and wellness for New Hampshire workplaces and your employees. We also strive to empower workplaces to provide support for employees in recovery, as well as those impacted by substance use disorder. And so what I mean by that is there are employees that are in your businesses that may have family members or loved ones who have struggled with substance use disorder or mental illness. And we look to also uh, support that employee in trying to support their loved ones. 
We are constantly trying to begin conversations that evolve to a point where we are challenging stigma. And that's really the first step to um, overcoming stigma is beginning as many uh, as over 300, almost 300 businesses throughout the state have done, having those conversations in the workplace to really start breaking stigma around substance use disorder and mental illness. And last but not least, our initiative encourages employee retention and productivity. And you're going to hear from a couple of speakers today that will talk about how they've been able to do that through developing a recovery friendly culture in their workplace. I'll also note here that um, we are currently engaged in outreach to I believe now over 26 states um, that are either using our model, interested in using our model, or are using elements of our model in their own recovery-friendly efforts. And we also have a wonderful grassroots program um, locally in Dover, New Hampshire, called the Dover Mental Health Alliance, that also has paralleled use of our model by helping to designate businesses as mental health-friendly workplaces in the Dover area. And Chameleon Group, who you will hear from shortly, is an example of one of those businesses that is duly designated as a champion in the recovery-friendly workplace movement, as well as recently designated as a mental health-friendly business in Dover. So how do we support our recovery-friendly workplaces? Well, we certainly have a structured approach, but it's flexible and it's very much customized to the level of readiness of a particular company or your particular needs. And one of the things that we do as advisors is try to connect you to the statewide and the local resources that might be helpful for your employees in sustaining their health and wellness. We also provide tools and materials that are curated for each workplace. And we also offer no cost trainings to the workplace. We are all about connecting businesses to other businesses that may be champions in this work where they can talk about some of the policies that have been developed and have worked for them over time, as well as templates that they might use in terms of something like a return to work agreement. Certainly, we're always connecting employees who desire to connect to peers in recovery um, to those recovery community organizations throughout the state. And of course, we're always making workforce development connections. This is just a little snapshot of our what we call our checklist. Um, the first thing that would happen for a business that's interested in learning more than what I'll be able to present today about the initiative is to submit a letter of interest. And I've asked Heather to put the link to that letter of interest in the chat. So you can just click on that and complete that if you're interested in hearing more and receiving a full orientation uh, from one of our advisors. Following an orientation, we would then um, ask the company when they're ready to create their own uh, declaration which states their commitment to developing a recovery friendly culture. And that is normally shared with all employees after which we do um, ask that the governor um, sign a certificate um, and officially then they would be designated as a recovery friendly workplace. And that sort of starts the clock to a year following where the advisor would be speaking again in more detail with representatives from a particular company or organization or even a city or a town. I actually work with the city of Manchester, city of Nashua and the town of Raymond now, which re recently became designated. So it might be a, a, a town or a city that would be designated, but we're always looking to provide um, information, resources, connect to recovery organizations and provide those no-cost trainings that I mentioned earlier, as well as we always want to entertain what ideas the company might have um, to further develop their recovery-friendly culture and support their employees. This is um, just a good view of our current trainings that we offer. Um, while we can right now do some of them in person, we also can do all of them online and many of them are self-paced. So I just wanted to share that with you. And certainly if you have any additional questions about our training or anything in this presentation, you can email me at karen at recoveryfriendlyworkplace.com. I do wanna make mention of a new training opportunity that's coming up next Wednesday on October 6th. And this came about as a result of a survey that we did with the city of Manchester in which it was identified 
that they wanted to have more resources around how they could become more resilient with regards to compassion fatigue and stress. So this one is called, You Have More Power Than You Know. It'll be from 12 to three next Wednesday. And one of the key objectives um, that the um, instructor, Ginger Ross, is looking to have people walk away with is their own 411 plan to adopt new behaviors to reduce that compassion fatigue, burnout, and stress. So again, if you have a desire to sign up for that, again, a no cost training um, for anyone, really, it's really appropriate for anyone, feel free to email me. So um, I wanted to just talk briefly about more about why should employers get involved? Well, first of all, you're already employing people with substance use disorders. You just may not know that. And I know Dana is gonna touch on that when he speaks. Um, there are over 135,000 people in recovery in New Hampshire, and across the U.S., there are over 20 million people, which is about 10% with actual substance use disorder. Yet it's important to note that less than 15% of that 10% receive any kind of treatment. So what we know is work is where we reach a very large percentage of people, and this is an opportunity for us to really um, use uh, resources and support and connection and conversation that removes stigma to um, help uh, really impact the impact of substance use disorders and help people to sustain their recovery um, while they're, you know, in their lives. Um, and of course, talent retention, as I'm sure many of you know, I see many um, industries here that I know are um, really looking to fill some open positions. And so talent retention is a really good reason um, for this initiative to take hold because one of the things that we offer are templates on return to work agreements where if somebody is struggling, they can actually have an opportunity upon an agreement with their employer to return to the workplace um, and still continue purpose um, through work to sustain their recovery. There are all these additional benefits of addressing substance use disorders in the workplace. And again, I'm going to defer to um, the presenters that I have arranged for you to talk a little bit more about them. So another great reason for um, employers to um, be getting involved with this initial uh, initiative is the cost of substance misuse in New Hampshire. As you can see, it's pretty large, 2.36 billion. And out of that, 66% or 1.6 billion is lost in productivity. So by supporting individuals in their sustained recovery, we can actually reduce those numbers. I wanna talk a little bit about um, sort of a changed landscape that has occurred since, um, since COVID. Um, and what this shows, and I'm gonna comment a little bit more on it, is that um, during late June of 2020, 40% of US adults reported struggling with mental health or substance abuse. And there was actually, actually an article that appeared in 2021 where it stated that Americans are using alcohol to cope with pandemic stress and that nearly one in five report heavy drinking. There was also a study by the Rand Corporation last fall that found the frequency of alcohol consumption in the US rose 14% compared with before the pandemic. Also, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as of June 2020, 13% of Americans reported starting or increasing substance use as a way of coping with stress or emotions related to COVID-19. Overdoses have also spiked since the onset of the pandemic, and another reporting system shows that the early months of the pandemic brought an 18% increase nationwide in overdoses compared with those same months in 2019. The trend has continued through 2020 and according to the American Medical Association, which reported in December of 2020, more than 40 US states have seen increases in opioid related mortality, along with ongoing concerns for those with substance use disorder. So um, this really shines a light on the importance of looking at recovery as not just related to substance use disorder, but related to mental health and other things that go along with it. And you'll hear shortly about how a couple of employers have addressed it um, in that way, in, the, in looking at diverse areas of recovery in the workplace. This is um, just a quick example of um, something from the National Safety Council site, which some of you are probably familiar with, nsc.org. 
And what this shows is that workers in recovery help employers avoid over $4,000 in turnover and replacement costs. Workers in recovery actually miss 13.7 days less per year than workers with an unaddressed substance use disorder. And each employee who recovers from a substance use disorder saves the company over $8,500 on average. You can actually go to the site and there's a, a substance use calculator in which you can enter your own industry and kind of pull up uh, averages for your own company, which many have done and have found interesting. And it's actually propelled some companies to move forward to become a recovery friendly workplace. So what can employers do? Um, through the partnership recovery friendly advisor, um, we would do a needs assessment and determine level of readiness of your particular organization to move forward um, to become a recovery friendly workplace and continue to develop that recovery friendly culture. And today we're actually going to hear examples about all of these things on this list from our recovery friendly workplace champions um, about things that they do that actually support concepts on this list. So you'll be hearing from them shortly. Um, one of the things that we are often asked is how do we tell, you know, what are the signs and symptoms of a substance use concern in the workplace? And um, I feel like, especially even though there are many diverse employers represented here today, I think everyone here is a connector. And one of the things I just want to point out is that we feel the best identification practice is to have open and honest conversations with employees in a safe, supportive, and recovery-friendly environment with compassion. So creating this environment is really key to becoming a recovery-friendly workplace. And I feel like you would all be supportive of that. We, we certainly have that in common. So with that, I just wanted to share a little bit about um, a couple of case studies. Um, the first one is related to Genfoot America, which is actually located in the North Country. And Genfoot became designated a little over two years ago. And since that time, five employees have come forward looking for support resources and they've been successfully provided to those employees. As well as Genfoot has also looked to local recovery homes to hire new employees. And I know two of them have now become shift leaders. So that really shows progress in terms of um, how they've removed stigma and how they've opened up conversations and welcomed individuals from the recovery community as part of their employee team. Their employees have also uh, created a helping hands committee. And so there are individuals on that committee that are consistently looking um, at ways to improve acceptance and remove stigma. And also there are resources for employees if they don't feel comfortable, say going to their supervisor, they can go to somebody on the helping hands committee and receive um, connection and support resources. And Genfoot is one company that has actually seen decreases over the last two and a half years of accidents, injuries, lost days, and light duty days. And they do attribute that to becoming a recovery friendly workplace. Um, certainly I can connect you to any of these companies that are um, being represented today. And you can speak to um, leadership from any of these companies that would be happy to share more details with you. Hypertherm is another example of a wonderful champion. Um, this a uh, case study actually highlights the fact that it is not something that you can create overnight. A, a full-blown recovery-friendly workplace does not occur overnight. So what this demonstrates is that back in 2015, due to some personal stories of loss, Hypertherm established a task force. And as you can see, looking across over the years, other things happened. In 2017, substance use disorder policy changes occurred. In 2018, they become officially designated as a recovery friendly workplace. And 2019 and current to today, they've had a licensed alcohol and drug counselor on site that also provides support for recovery coaches, which they have on every single shift on site um, at their location. So this is a real champion. It just gives you some ideas of what one other company has done um, to create impact and to really remove stigma um, around the topic of substance use disorder and mental illness. This is a slide that uh, just kind of uh, gives a, a pictorial representation of the multiple pathways Hypertherm uses to support their employees. 
So they engage human resources, leadership, their EAP program, recovery coaches, the licensed alcohol and drug counselors. And they also have a website dedicated to substance use disorder, as well as resource cards that they distribute amongst their employees. Um, at this point, I would like to uh, introduce you to Borgia. Some of you may know him. He's the president and CEO of Waypoint. And um, he was part of a business panel discussion that we did a little while back. But I like uh, to play about three minutes of his comments because I feel like his comments, um, as he starts talking about the recovery friendly workplace, they really capture the essence of all dimensions of recovery beyond substance use disorder and including mental health and overall diversity, equity, and inclusion. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and play this video. We're sort of in the space as a provider of social services where we, um, we deal with people that are in recovery all the time. Um, we work with the um, homeless youth population that um, have been impacted by these uh, a lot. We work with moms and their young kids, and a lot of them are in recovery, and we get involved with them because they're in recovery. Uh, we also work with uh, foster care, and oftentimes uh, kids get placed in foster care because their parents can't take care of them. Um, and one of the things that we do in our business is really help these individuals and families sort of like, you know, get better, recover, get back on their feet. So we started investigating at that time in Manchester, a number of colleagues of mine that were going through the process and we engaged in sort of understanding more um, about it. And, um, and the minute we heard about it, we said, this is something that we absolutely have to do. We owe it to our clients and we owe it to um, our employees. We have 300 employees. And I, I'll be honest, exactly like you mentioned before, I don't know how many are struggling, but I can tell statistically there's a bunch of them right. that have either themselves or family members. Um, so I think it's an important journey for us. I've never heard anybody say, you know, I'm struggling with substance abuse or my spouse is sort of in detox right now and I have to take. So obviously it is not culturally a conversation that we know how to have in the workplace. And I think that's so wrong. And I think uh, what I want to do is move to a culture in which it is okay to talk about this because it happens everywhere. For us, and again, we started right before COVID, we had conversations and um, something became clear to us that um, the focus on sort of recovery friendly workplace was very important, but we wanted to be inclusive of all kinds of recovery. So for example, mental health, which is really prevalent in some of the people that we serve, it was important for us to include that. And then uh, May 25th happened and George Floyd was uh, murdered. Um, and there was an outcry um, in my agency, what are we going to do about this? So we um, diverted ourselves and we actually, Sam was really helpful in, in sort of coaching us because the initial was, okay, we're gonna be about recovery. And then we make this much bigger uh, claim around um, uh, racial equity and diversity. So our declaration is actually much more extensive than most declarations because we're like throwing everything under the sink and that it's all about this. But what we did is we formed a committee, the 16 people that actually, and I started the committee, but I said, I want to start the committee because I'm the CEO and I want you to understand that I'm behind this. But I really want to empower this committee to make the decisions. And if I'm there, it's going to be really hard. So actually, I have removed myself now from the committee. And the committee is designing a survey, is designing the trainings that we're going to have, is going to put a, a, a plan in place. And they have been empowered in the organization to actually take the leadership and the charge of uh, you know, changing the, the culture for us. We've been actually very lucky that there's a, a pilot program. Um, it's out of the um, Hypertherm uh, Foundation, the Hope Foundation. And so um, if you would like to hear more about Borgia's presentation, um, you can actually uh, request a link from me, as well as you can view the whole business panel discussion on our LinkedIn page. So at this time, I would like to introduce uh, three recovery friendly champions that have graciously agreed to share their experiences with everyone here today. Um, first, you'll hear from Dana LaRiviere, who is the CEO of Chameleon Group in Dover. 
And then you'll hear from Caroline Consoli. Uh, she's a human resources business partner with the Mental Health Center of Greater Manchester. And then you'll also hear from Randy Stevens, who is a CRSW and a peer support specialist for Pro Health, which is part of the Mental Health Center for Greater Manchester, as well as he is a member of the Manchester Rapid Response Team. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna have Dana take it away. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. As I was joking with Karen uh, earlier, if, if you give me an opportunity and a forum to speak, I may not stop. Um, and I'm especially passionate about this particular topic. Our company is about 20 years old and we are in, uh, in Dover, New Hampshire. Um, we're a call center. Uh, we employ roughly between 40 and 50 employees at any given time. Our journey started back in about 2016 timeframe and was really born out of necessity. Um, we had employees, as most businesses um, who have a variety of backgrounds, um, and we had one particular employee who was not a very dependable employee. Um, and ultimately, that's not a that's not a remarkable thing for our uh, company. Um, there are people that are more dependable than others. This employee eventually we terminated for not being very dependable. And that was the end of that. Uh, two years later, we got contacted by that same individual looking for to get their job back. And we found out through our conversations that the reason why this individual was undependable was she was hooked on heroin when she worked for us. Um, that really, and again, I'm the original person that I'm probably not your traditional person in the workforce that would you would think would be attracted to this initiative. I was the original person that said, listen, that's their issue. They did it. It was their choice to do it. Um, let them figure it out. Um, but as I was speaking with this individual who had become a recovery coach and was sponsoring people, I, I was I was really caused to pause and think about what it is that that all means and, and do people really deserve a second chance? And we've been very fortunate in our company and our organization that we've had a long tenure and been able to do this for quite a while. And we kind of looked at this as an opportunity to engage in a conversation with an individual to find out their personal story. Um, we made the determination, I made the determination to bring her back on board, which was in direct opposition to all of my policies. Um, all of my policies said if somebody is let go for being unreliable, they don't come back. So then I had an issue. I had to go sell it to my management team, right? Because here I am trying to convince them to do something that I said we weren't going to do. And I also had to tell them that we were going to be hiring somebody who was an addict. Um, and that's where we began, where I began to really start to get an understanding that we were going to need some help and support. Because the people that were my managers, were my friends, had been my trusted associates for years and years, had sort of thrown up that stigma wall right away. Um, do we really want somebody in our organization that's this? Or what if they do that? And, and it became apparent to us very quickly that there was no there was no employee handbook that was going to deal with this. There was nothing we looked around. There was no path for us to be able to go figure it out. And around that time was also the time when the state of New Hampshire's unemployment rate was plummeting. Um, Sarah, the, the individual that we had brought back on board, not only did she do a great job, she did a terrific job for us. She's so well that she was promoted to an inside sales manager and we were looking for people. As I was talking to her at lunch one day, I said, Sarah, are, are there other people like you out there? And she goes, are you kidding me? Uh, yeah. So I said, well, how do we get them? How do we talk to them? I'm thinking here I am being a pretty clever business guy that I'm going to go out there and approach some people that maybe other businesses don't want, which I'm going to tap into this pool of folks. That's kind of how Karen came into the story because Karen at the time was working for a recovery agency and we were introduced and we said, okay, this is what we want to do. We want to recruit. We want to talk to some people. We need a policy. We need all this other kind of stuff. And we very rapidly discovered that we needed to be able to talk to our managers because if we were going to take this on, we wanted to be able to do it in a manner where we were open, honest, communicative with everybody. And we worked through all of the issues and all of the, the, the promises that we were about to make. Um, 
around this time was when we started talking with the with the uh, government. We started to be aware of the governor's recovery friendly workplace community. And I, I joke with people that I, I got asked to serve on the commission as a way to keep an eye on me. Um, because we were such advocates within the community and because we were speaking up, I really wanted to know, hey, hold on a minute. I, I get that there are people that are in the mental health arena. And I get that there are people that are in the recovery community, but we need people to connect with the businesses to help the businesses be able to do what they need to do to be able to, to adopt this. It's not enough just to ask them. One of the best uh, conversations I ever had was with a, a colleague, a friend of mine who said, that's all well and good for you, Dana, but um, I, my, my employees will handle cash. I, you know, I really can't, you know, can't do that. And I said, well, you know what the difference is between you and I is we both have people who are struggling with substance use disorder in our company. I just know who they are. Um, and we provide the resources for these folks. So, I, I think when we originally began this journey, one of the things that we discovered very quickly was the importance of being able to network with other people in the community, other people in the business community, the recovery friendly workplace advisors who are a godsend for our company um, and the recovery agencies. We have somebody from a local recovery agency that comes into our business once a week, spends a couple of hours and just is there to be able to speak with anybody in the organization. Karen mentioned about the the you know developing policies and 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 she put a very uh, comprehensive slide about the process and the journey to becoming a recovery friendly workplace and I would like to say to you that the recovery friendly workplace advisors meet you where you're at as a business so not all of those things apply necessarily in that order or in a nice, neat little package. They come and they work with you to understand what are your priorities as a business? How do we make sure that each one of those steps that are most appropriate for you get done? And how do we connect you with other people around the state and around the country um, that are experiencing or have experienced these things? And how can we leverage that experience and leverage that knowledge? Um, one of the um, one of the most important things that I've gotten from being a recovery friendly workplace organization is I've been able to connect with my peers in other companies, big and small. And I always say my best ideas are stolen because I, I go and I ask them, oh, you have a return to work policy. Can I have that? Can, can we look at that? And they're very open and they're very sharing. Or sometimes I'll place a phone call to Karen and say, OK, I thought I've heard everything. Can you help? And, and it really is about connecting you with the resources and connecting you with the people that are around you. The other thing that I will say is uh, becoming a recovery friendly workplace is not something that you do. It's something that you are. And our organization has, we've evolved to the point where we don't even think of ourselves as a recovery friendly workplace. We think of ourselves as an employee friendly workplace. Uh, and, and our position is, of course, we want to do things that will help and support our employees. Of course, we would want to be compassionate. Sometimes it's being able to open up those conversations and have those discussions with people. Um, I, again, one of the things that I'm fond of saying is if I had an employee that came to me and said, Dana, I've just been diagnosed with cancer. Well, my first thought wouldn't be, you need to be whacked. You, know, you need to go. No, it would be, what can we do for you? How can we help you? Oh my God. Um, so today, as we stand here today, uh, we actively recruit uh, people who are in recovery. We actively recruit people in recovery. Also, as we stand here today, we have better and more open conversations with all of our employees, not just the people who are in recovery, all of them. And we learn this from our experience with the recovery friendly workplace, because almost no topic is taboo. They know that if they've got an issue, they've got a personal issue, they've got a mental health issue, they can come to our management team and they're going to be listened to. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have people be accountable. That doesn't mean that we're going to, uh, you know, just do whatever, but it means they'll have a forum. They can bring it to the management team. Um, the other thing that I will, will say is that we have, it is, it is engendered unbelievable loyalty 
with our employees, especially people that are in the recovery community, because people will say, you gave me an opportunity, you gave me a chance. I've had people say, this is the first time in my adult life that I haven't had to lie on a resume, um, or I haven't had to explain these giant gaps in my resume um, as to what was going on. And, and we mean it. We, we actually, we went from the early days of saying, gosh, I don't know if I want to let anybody know that we're recovery friendly, to we wear it as a proud badge and we, we lead with that. We lead with that with my customers and my prospects. We lead with that with our employee prospects. And, and, and we believe that being a mental health friendly workplace is not remarkable. It dovetails into exactly what we're trying to do as a culture and as a, a corporate ethos. I'm gonna take a breath now <laughs> um, and see if anybody has any questions or if there's any, uh, anything else any other place I can go, Karen? Dana, I so appreciate um, your insights as always. And um, if it's, um, I think it's probably a good idea to move on to Caroline. I know I can see people are putting questions in the chat. So we will address those as soon as Caroline and Randy have an opportunity to speak. So thank you again, Dana. And with that, I'll turn it over to Caroline. Thank you so much, Karen. Hi everyone, I will try to keep my comments brief. I wanna make sure Randy has some time to speak as well because he's really gonna be um, expanding on a lot of the things that I'm mentioning. Um, but I'll start with just telling you a little bit about the Mental Health Center. And then I'll talk a little bit about my experience with us becoming a recovery friendly workplace and my experiences from a human resources perspective. Um, so the Mental Health Center of Greater Manchester is a nonprofit community mental health center. Um, we've been around for over 60 years and we currently have over 450 employees. And I always like to say that um, in terms of what sorts of services we offer to folks in the community, um, we offer pretty much any mental health service you could possibly think of. We have um, departments who are devoted to um, both inpatient and outpatient services. We have quite a number of community outreach services. Um, so our mental health professionals are going out into the community um, to meet with clients, with whoever they may be. Um, we have crisis intervention uh, departments as well to see people who are experiencing uh, mental health crisis right in the moment. Um, I could go on and on, but I'll cut off the list there. Um, but we do have quite a um, variety of services that we offer. And I think we as a company were um, fairly fortunate um, in the fact that our mission, our vision and guiding values, they're already geared towards um, promoting recovery and wellness and um, eradicating stigma around mental health and addiction. Um, so when the opportunity to become a recovery friendly, an official recovery friendly workplace came to us, it was kind of a no brainer um, because we thought we're really already doing a lot of these things and holding these philosophies um, in terms of our clients. And I think it was kind of implicit that those same philosophies carried over to employees, but it was never really officially stated. Um, and I think it was really important to kind of officially state that and acknowledge that uh, we are um, promoting recovery, not just among our clients, but among our employees and our staff members who are working with our clients every day. Um, so when we were creating our statement for our philosophy of a recovery friendly workplace, um, we were fortunately able to take a lot of things from our mission and kind of copy and paste it right in there. So one thing we strive to do is to create a healthy, safe, and stigma-free work environment. Um, we strive to eliminate barriers to those who are impacted by addiction. Um, and one way we do that is through our hiring practices, which I think Randy will probably talk about in just a little bit, or at least reference those. Um, and then the, the third thing that we strive to do is to encourage all employees to reach out to us for help and support because um, that's one of the ways that we can decrease the stigma around recovery and addiction is by telling our employees that it's okay to come to human resources and we're not here to judge you or to fire you but we want to give you um, those resources to to help you in that journey um, and then just to wrap up i did want to share a quick story of 
um, one way that the Recovery Friendly Workplace Initiative really impacted me as a professional in human resources. So a couple of months ago, I had an employee who came to me um, and revealed to me that he was, he had relapsed um, and was struggling with alcohol addiction again. And as we're saying, I, I had no idea that he was um, in recovery, that he had struggled with addiction, because you really don't see that just by looking at someone. So that uh, admission really sort of blindsided me for a moment. Um, and I think had we not had the resources from the Recovery Friendly Workplace Initiative, I honestly wouldn't have known how to even continue that conversation or how to help him. But thankfully, I remembered that we had those resources and um, we had gotten really helpful guides for treatment resources and recovery resources. And I was able to give them to this employee and say, these are places where you can get treatment. These are the phone numbers and the addresses. And thankfully, we have our employee assistance program that was able to supplement those resources as well. But just having those resources gave me more confidence as, as a manager, as an HR person, to know that I had something that I could give this person to kind of get them started on their journey to recovery, rather than saying, I have no idea how to help you at all. So that's really my piece. Um, I'll hand things over, or I'll let Karen hand things over to Randy next. Thank you so much, Caroline. Again, so appreciate your time today um, to sharing your insights. And with that, I will turn it over to Randy. Hello, um, my name is Randy Stevens. I'm a CRSW at the Mental Health Center for the Pro Health Department. Um, my story starts uh, as a child. Um, I suffered with about seven years of um, serious abuse which untreated led to a, um, a progressive substance use disorder. Um, started with alcohol and marijuana at the age of 12. Um, I thankfully graduated and, got, and was recruited into the military. In that time, um, my alcohol use got worse. Um, and when I, was injured in the military they gave me opiates and eventually led to a really uh, bad opiate addiction um i first started recovery in 2013 um, i lasted about a year before i had a recurrence of use um over the next i think it was five years at that point um i i was in and out of recovery uh i wasn't able to be honest with any employers um I had to, you know, try to put on this front uh, to be this this together guy. You know, I was a family man. I had children and a wife um, to support, so you know, work was essential for me. And um, I was a carpenter at the time. And you know, uh, a lot of people. I mean, there's a lot of substance misuse going on in that field, but it's not it's swept under the rug and not talked about. And, you know, if you have a problem, you're fired and let go and more, and, you know, people move on very quickly. So you have to try to hide that. So I feel like that's, you know, relevant to say um, that, you know, in this meeting. Um, so in 2016, I uh, started a binge of like a year and a half, a little over a year of really bad, um, addiction in, to fentanyl and it culminated eventually in a prison sentence. But prior to the prison sentence, I, I, I started getting sober in 2018. Um, I had found out I had another child on the way and I wasn't about to bring another child into that life. Um, my my ex-wife and I were both heavy users at that point and it was you know um, having a, an effect on my other children. and. You, no matter how much you try to hide it, you can't hide that. Um, so in 2000, in September, 2018, my ex-wife was arrested um, with a significant amount of drugs and kind of ripped out of me and my children's life. And shortly thereafter, my children were taken um, because the state felt that, you know, the amount of drugs that we were, that were in the household, you know, um, obviously was 
probably having a negative effect on my children. Um, so I'm within that, within about two weeks of my children being taken, uh, I end up homeless because my landlord doesn't want, you know, drug dealers in his um, house. And, um, and I was, and I was off and running again. I had gotten sober at that point, but I had, uh, you know, that was, that was a little too much for me to handle. So, um, I, through that relapse, I ended up getting very sick. I had a, uh, I had pneumonia in my lung, um, untreated. I had some other like lung infection thing going on and it hospitalized me. Thank God, because, um, I came out of the hospital in uh, November 20th, 2018, uh, sober and I stayed sober. I went to a meeting. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to backtrack because I missed something very important. It was beginning of November, end of October, um, when I was sick, I was viciously sick, trying to, I was moving from place to place, trying to stay warm. I don't know if you guys remember in 2018, that fall, it was horrifically cold. It was horrible. And I had not enough clothes. Um, I was stealing for anything I could get, um, to, to survive money, uh, clothes, food literally would just walk out of stores and that's how I survived for like two months. Um, so <clears throat> I, I was walking, I remember I fell asleep in this abandoned house in Rochester and, um, I woke up and I was so sick. I could barely breathe. Um, the pneumonia, when you lay down, it would like suffocate me. Um, and so I'm, I'm crying and I'm walking down the road and I like, I remember I was just came to a point where I'm like, I need to, I need to change. So I, 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 am a very spiritual person. I reached out to God in that moment. And I, I prayed. Um, I was, I just asked, you know, help me get through this, help me find something that to get, to get through this moment or, or just take me now. Cause, um, I'd had enough. Um, that was, that was, uh, about an hour before my mother, before I found a phone to use, um, I wasn't in the best shape at the time. So it's kind of, not surprising that many people were like, you know, weren't running right over to try to help me, you know, um, <clears throat> it's probably a little scary, <laughs> uh, strung out and, uh, um, very sick. So, uh, someone did help me though. They gave me a cell phone. I called my mother and my mother hadn't answered in many months at that point. And, um, she answered and she sent my sister over to get me at a, at a, um, a business. I forget it was a pizza place or something. And, they brought me to the hospital and that's when I got to the hospital and I stayed there. They fixed me up. I had surgery in my lung, um, had a, a bunch of fluid removed, um, and come out 11, 20, 2018. And I was, um, sober and went straight to a meeting. My mother brought me to a meeting. Um, and my daughter was born 18 days later. <clears throat> she, I was sober and I don't know why I'm so emotional in this. <laughs> it's not the first time I've told this story. Um, <clears throat> so she was, <clears throat> excuse me, she was born to a sober father and uh, <clears throat> very grateful for that. 13 days after she was born, she was born addicted. My, my ex-wife uh, was on methadone in, in uh, jail. And so she was like, this is a big motivator for never going back to that lifestyle again. Uh, <clears throat> she was little little tiny thing and she would sleep on my chest and shiver and it was like the worst thing to watch for your child <clears throat> and so <clears throat> excuse me 13 days after she was born the federal government decided that was the time to take me off the street <clears throat> and um arrested me for something that had happened like six seven months earlier uh someone had gotten arrested and decided to say that the drugs were mine. Um, I never knew about it. I, you know, my, my wife getting, my ex-wife um, getting arrested had very little to do with me at that time. So I didn't know that was coming. Um, so uh, I got to jail and Stratford County, I'm sitting in the holding tank and I'm like, man, this guy, this guy came in with me and he had uh, fentanyl. He's like, you want a line? Um, and I, I'm not sure at that point what exactly went through my mind, but I was the first time out of 
you know, now many times that I was able to say no um, with it, you know, right in my face. And I decided, you know, that pretty much within that time, some, some point very close to that, I was like, I was done. I was, I need to do something to figure out, you know, so I started um, programming. I did my own program. Stratford County is actually surprisingly really recovery friendly. Um, they had yoga master come in uh, once a week who taught yoga. That was beautiful. Um, very peaceful and relaxing. And that's, this was in general population, mind you. So for three months, I was in general population, just programming myself, reading everything I could, crying every day. <laughs> um, Cause when you're coming off of drugs, your, your brain and your, you know, your emotions, it's just all over the place. So um, it was very cathartic though. And I was able to kind of purge all that crap that I've been holding on to. And I even started, they had a seeking safety class. And I started addressing some of the trauma from when I was a child um, and uh, just had a lot of support there. So fast forward, I went through their um, therapeutic community program, graduated that, went back to the general population, continued my, my programming, um, started AA and NA in there. And uh, we had a big group of guys that were recovering together. And it was kind of the beginning of learning that I really enjoyed being a part of people's journey and um, mentoring people. Um, so I went to the feds and by kind of luck, I was put right into um, their, their residential drug and alcohol program in the BOP. And within a month of being there, I, I don't know if it was just evident that I'd been, you know, doing recovery and, um, <clears throat> Well, so they, they had me mentoring within a month. And so I spent the next 17 months as a mentor in that program. I graduated that program. And uh, when I got out, I remember in that program, I'm going, I want to do something with this. And I, I'm i thinking like, nobody's going to hire me because I'm, I have a record longer than I am tall. And I'm six one, by the way. So <laughs> it's significant. Yeah, you can ask Caroline, she knows. <laughs> so um, I... Yeah. So I, I'm like, okay, well, at least I'll be a really good sponsor for somebody, you know, cause I've learned all this information and I know all this stuff and I'm like, a you know, and I loved helping people. Um, and it, I was voted as a, at our graduation, I was voted most likely to start an AA meeting. Um, so that being said, I get out and a friend of mine worked for pro health. She works through, a, um, one of the people we collaborate with. She's a uh, primary care physician for Amos Keg, and, she told uh, Margaret, my boss over here that, you know, that I just gotten out and um, that I was because they were looking for a peer. I didn't know what a peer was, but she calls me and she's like, uh, they're looking for a peer over there, you know, and she told me how to how to apply online. And I was like, okay, that sounds cool. I mean, you know, do they know, you know, that I just that I'm, I'm in the halfway house, I still I'm still in prison, technically. And she's like, yeah, yeah, they, they still want you. I'm like, that's crazy okay let me give it a shot so i i got in a, i got in, online did the did the application i got here for the interview and i said that i was like you realize i'm in i'm in the halfway house right i'm still incarcerated and they're like yeah yeah your lived experience is what we want i'm like hmm okay and you're gonna pay me for for this right <laughs> this isn't a volunteer job you know um and i was like i, I remember sitting at the interview and just like blown away by how like warm and welcoming and kind this woman was and this this clinician that was with her um and how like like open they were from, and I was able to be honest and just tell them everything and I didn't have to hide anything and they gave me a second interview at that interview they were like you know how would you feel about working here I'm like well I mean it sounds like a really great place for anyone to work I, especially me you know um I guess you go through you know you suffer an addiction for so long, you don't feel like you're <clears throat> worthy of these things. And when you have people like the mental health center telling you that, you know, you're valued, um, that you matter, that, uh, that really, <clears throat> really helps you, you know, start to re refocus and reframe how you see yourself, you know, um, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity that these people have provided me. Um, the fact that they work, work with me on a regular basis to make sure that my mental health is, is good, that I'm, you know, doing what I have to do in my recovery. And I'm, because of them, I'm able to help other people. Um, a lot of people actually. And, you know, it, it's a wonderful feeling. Um, 
Sorry. <laughs> I got I almost three years sober, and I'm still so emotional. It's ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> so, okay. So, yeah. Randy, I'm just going to give you a break and say something. You're a beautiful, beautiful person. The fact that you're on here with, it's probably why you're so emotional. It's a different group, right? We're, we haven't been through, well, I can't speak for everyone, but we have not been, most of us have not been through what you've been through. So to speak to a group like this is very different than speaking to an AA meeting or a Narcotics Anonymous or all these other groups where they were leading to you and you guys probably have the same language and the same, you guys just have this, this connection, right? So kudos to you to have the courage, the strength and, and the energy to speak to us. Um, I, I, you know, I'm listening to you and you're giving me hope for a family member I have, like you're giving me so much hope. So thank you. Thank you for that. <clears throat> now we're all emotional, <laughs> um, which is a good thing. Uh, this is how we remove stigma. Jimmy, I think you had your hand up and wanted to say something. Oh, I was actually just clapping. I mean, you learn so much, uh, from walking in somebody else's shoes and when you see somebody on the street, we just don't recognize sometimes what they're going through. And uh, it, you know, it, we have to be able to stop sometimes and just talk and, and do what we can to help. So Randy, your story was extremely moving and I applaud you, my brother, as a, another veteran for being able to climb out of that pit. A lot of our brothers and sisters don't. So mm -hmm. keep doing what you're doing, keep moving forward and keep helping anybody you come in contact with. You got a purpose, brother. Thank you. Thank you. And boy, is this a perfect example of how the workplace can be part of an employee's support network um, and give someone a second chance and <clears throat> provide as they have purpose through work as they have for Randy. So um, Randy, you know, I so appreciate you. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, Heather, I think there might be some questions in chat. Is that right? Um, I'll tell you some of the attendees would love your PowerPoint slides. Can we send those in the post-event email? Absolutely, of course. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. That's great. Um, I didn't see any of your direct questions to um, address right now, but like we said, after we all get our tissues, we're, we're going to be <laughs> staying around. Randy, you were killing me. Oh, man. <laughs> we're going to be hanging out here. Um, if you have any questions that you want to directly ask to Karen or any of the speakers, um, if they're able to hang as well. Um, but thank you all for attending. That was um, amazing. Thank you, Randy, for making me cry multiple times. Um, and uh, just, just, just an amazing program. And I have to say, I loved also what Dana said about that the recovery friendly workplace will meet you where you're at. Because I think sometimes people think it's this big thing that, oh, I don't know if I can do all that. And it, it, you can do whatever you are able to do to step towards a, a better culture to support um, people in recovery and people who are also in families in, of people in recovery. I mean, this touches all of us. So mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's amazing. So I definitely encourage you to reach out to Karen. Um, her email and contact will all be in the post event email um, and is also on the chat as well. So. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, Heather, for giving us all this opportunity to um, experience some lived experience um, and also hear about some of the um, successes of some of the businesses that we're working with. And, um, you know, of course, I welcome anyone to reach out uh, directly to me on email with any questions, but I'd just like to know if anyone has any questions now, we're here and we're happy to hear from any others of you who have any questions at all about anything that was presented today. Awesome, I'm gonna stop the recording now and anyone who wants to pop off because you have your next Zoom to Zoom to at one o'clock, we thank you for being here. If anybody else wants to stay on and ask questions, we'll be here as well. Thank you so much.